Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the Tech Coach. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. If you're an instructional technology coach, this is the show for you. We're going to be tackling all things professional development. Stick with us. Check us out over on iTunes. And of course, you can go to askthetechcoach.com for more information. Today, we're talking about professional development, innovative professional development. What makes PD off the wall. How do we change the culture in our school? There's a lot of great ways that you can reach out and be a part of our show. You can, of course, find us on Twitter at AskTheTechCoach. Again, visit AskTheTechCoach.com and, of course, leave us a voice message over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. If you're an instructional technology coach, we want to hear from you. I have two fantastic guests returning to the TeacherCast Educational Network is our good friend, Dr. Sam Patterson. Sam, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Um, You are doing some great things these days. You recently put out a post on my paperless classroom all about toy hacking. Um, How's everything going? You just recently came back from South by Southwest. Fresh off of South by Southwest. uh, The toy hacking presentation was really a great opportunity to talk to people. Um, It's an interesting project because it's just a year old. And like in that one year ago, I knew absolutely nothing about this thing I'm trying to teach with. So this presentation on South by Southwest was a lot of stories. And it was one of the first times in a while that I've done a multi-part presentation, like multiple presenters and whatnot. And there wasn't a hands-on element. It was actually two hours of talking. And yet it managed to be engaging. So it kind of defied my own expectations. Now, talk to us a little bit about South by Southwest. We've talked a lot about major, major conferences like the Ed Camps and ISTEs and ICES and stuff. What is South by Southwest uh, EDU? This, this was the version, right? Right. It was South by Southwest EDU. It is the, um, you know, annoying little sister of the South by Southwest conference. But... Um, the Probably the nerdy little sister, actually. Um, and... You know, one one of the things that really struck me was that on the last day of the EDU conference, it really feels like they're just shuffling all the teachers out of the way because they're like, hey, teachers, hey, all you nice people, could you just scoot out of the way? We have to make room for all of the liquor and the strippers. Um, it's it's a very strange educational space because there's not, you know, there's a lot of talk about innovation, but it's the same time there's you know, just a lot of different conversations going on there's a pretty strong maker community there and mm-hmm. i like that and there's a very um kind of visceral discussion about what it means to be people teaching specifically as it relates to race culture and what the what the role of the teacher within that culture is so that's been a really interesting kind of conversation that goes on there. Well, I like that conversation. And that's that's really what we're here today to talk about, the role of the teacher and how it affects and changes culture. I want to bring on our next guest here. He is an educator from California, the former director, uh, chief executive offer, the former chief executive officer. Uh, uh, Wow, Sam. You, know, you, just, you could just say CEO. The, it, yeah, the former CEO at Q, and now he has an, a, a fantastic new adventure ahead of him. Mike Lawrence, how are you today? Welcome to the program. I'm doing well. I also just came back from the uh, the more entrepreneurial little sister of South by Southwest. I think that's the better way to describe it. That's probably, you know, I, I actually have kind of an allergy to entrepreneurship and, <laughs> you know, overtly aggressive capitalism so that was probably my difficulty in describing south yeah. by southwest that is yeah. a, that is a much longer acronym that we need for next year the, the small child sister of mike tell us a little bit about yourself uh, i understand you have a new uh, a, a new, new adventure ahead of you i do actually i just started i started on monday uh, I'm the senior director of educator engagement at Power School. Uh, if you aren't familiar with Power School, they serve we serve 32 million students across uh, the globe, uh, mostly with student information systems and um, LMS systems. Uh, a lot of recent uh, uh, acquisitions the last couple of years, and we've been growing steadily. And so they uh, reached out to me, and it's a great fit. And I. Uh, I love working with the team. In fact, I just got a text that was the ding you heard that Aaron is listening to the live stream right now. So shout out to Aaron Dwyer 
who uh, reached out to me and said, Mike, you need to come work with Power School. So uh, very excited about it. Um, in terms of what else I've done, I, I started my educational career as a high school English teacher. So I'm the one that's correct Woo-hoo. your, your uh, grammar as, as it happens in my head, and I can't turn it off, and I apologize. We can debate about Oxford commas, if you'd like, and two spaces after a period after the, the podcast. Just let me know. It, it, Sam, can you is talk it too- objectively about the subjective case? <laughs> can yes. you talk subjectively about the objective case? Theoretically. <laughs> theoretically only. Yes. So, Mike, um, you know, we're here to talk today about innovative PD. And, and obviously, over the last few years, your role as CEO of Q has seen a, a, a wide variety of innovative PD. Um, and, and obviously, I wanted to have Sam on here because toy hacking is something that you you just don't see every day. The idea of taking objects around your house, around your classroom and, and doing something amazing with it, you know, this show here is geared for instructional technology coaches. I, I do believe that there's a difference between week day professional development and week end professional development. It really comes down to culture, the culture inside of your school district, inside of your buildings versus maybe the culture of those that gather at a conference like an ed camp or a Q or an ice or a, uh, what, 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 what's the acronym now? Something, something by Southwest Southwest. Right. Yes. What, where are we right now, Mike? What, what would you say the state of professional development is in 2018? Is there a state of professional development? Well, I'll tell you what I've seen, and it's pretty exciting. I think we've been talking about for years how we need to personalize le- learning for our students. And I feel that we finally have taken our own medicine and we're personalizing professional learning. We're allowing uh, these educators to come to events and decide and own their own learning and vote with their feet. And in some cases, stand up and they become the presenter like uh, that sort of flexibility, that sort of personalized learning uh, that we always sought for and, and, and quite often actually att- succeeded in with the students. We're now successfully doing that with teachers. Um, that's not to say that all professional development has embraced that concept. I think there's still plenty of professional development that is being done to you rather than being done with you. And that would be the difference I would describe to your earlier distinction between the weekend and the weekday, far too often the weekday professional development is something that is done to the attendees is rather than done with them. So that's where I see us. And I I think it's very exciting. Well, I, I, I can't see being in a Monday meeting and then getting up out of my meeting room and walking to another meeting room and sitting down, right? Like when you say voting with your feet, uh, teachers are allowed to do that, but there's consequences. You right, right. You know, just like you, you're free to do anything you want, but your boss won't like it when you walk out of that meeting. Well, okay, Mike, you just used two different terms, and I'm glad that we're going to start this out. In 2018, is it professional development or is it professional learning? I, I push for professional learning. It's what we're there for, right? Development is something done to you. Learning is something that you do that you you, you have now, you, uh, you see i told you it was going to be about the subjective and the objective case right that earlier that's fairly yeah. good point there i just wanted to hammer it home just so avoid how, using passive voice please so how how do we make that change at our schools right because we have pd days right so everybody knows that pd is coming up how do we make that suggestion to our uppers or how do we make that culture shift to say okay we're going to have a pl day well i i would posit that one of the things we have to do is realize there's different types of things we learn we've been using essentially one professional development model for everything. And even though I'm going to be the guy who's going to run a professional learning session where we all end up doing different things and one of us ends up setting a small fire, I would argue there are still opportunities where, you know, you should be taught specific things. They're called trainings. They have a bundle of content that has to be delivered to the learner. There's usually a legal requirement behind it. In my school, we do this around things like OSHA safety, uh, CPR, concussion awareness. These are you know, trainings that are done to us. We sometimes do this around something like uh, responsive classroom, specific techniques in that. Anything where it's very like, here is this body of knowledge that you all have to kind of know. But then there's this, here's this family of things I need you to be able to do. And if we're trying to teach a doing thing, 
We need to teach it in a doing way. Well, okay, let's take that. Uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that I always think about in the beginning of the year is HIV or bloodborne pathogens, right? And we all know about bloodborne pathogens. You know, if it's wet and it's not yours, don't touch it, right? But is there a way to do that in an innovative way, right? Like, can you, and, and I know I'm going to say this because of, of Mike here, but can you steampunk teaching uh, bloodborne pathogens? Or does it have to be listen to PowerPoint, fill out test? Let's get this over with. What's your goal for teaching bloodborne pathogens? Si- uh, the teacher, student, safety, health, you know, right? Whatever that. Whatever is, it, the- is it compliance with guidelines? Could be. Well, if it's compliance with guidelines, I would say that that's a really good opportunity to be like, here is the test. Do you know these guidelines? Do but you that, understand the value of complying with them? But, but does anybody really watch the 45 minute video and then pass the three multiple choice questions, right? Like, is if that you learning? Pass the three multiple choice questions, you understand the guideline. I don't care what you did with the video, right? Like, honestly, bloodborne pathogens on our end of it is about. You can summarize it in one really queasy sentence, just as you did earlier, right? So, sure, there's a 45-minute training for it, but we're going to put that online, and we're going to let you all game the system in the privacy of your own rooms so we can tell our insurance company that you participated in the training. That's what I consider a healthy professional development environment. Can I get you into a room, Sam, and say, I need you to develop a puppet show that teaches somebody about bloodborne pathogens, and that's how I'm going to show that you know the knowledge? Because that's the same thing that we're talking about if it was social studies, right? Like, it doesn't matter if it's a screencast or a podcast or a, a whatever. Show me you know the knowledge. Why can't we do that? Oh, we, you certainly can. But then you have to be able to, like, ultimately, my employer would then need our insurance company to accept my video about bloodborne pathogens as evidence of understanding, right? Well, so we're, we're educational professionals. I think that we could see anything like this as a challenge. And I think to answer your earlier question, Jeffrey, how do you get that shift? How do you get that change? It's cultural. You need to have a leader that gets it and understands learning and embraces it, not just for the students that walk through the doors, but also the staff and work with them as a partner. So you're the tech coach. You say, hey, I've got this idea. Since all that we really care about is that our staff understands the the safety hazards around bloodborne pathogens, then let's take a different approach to make sure that they've all mastered it. And it might take one person five minutes and it might take another person 15, just as it took different kids a different amount of time to learn, you know, the Pythagorean theory. Uh, that's, That's a theorem, rather. Let's take that same approach for professional development and then use that bonus time we have to go a little further and learn more things uh, that we, we would have had to cover with a binder in a training. Um, so I think, I think if we're truly professionals in education and care about learning, I think all of those things, even compliance-based uh, learning opportunities, could be put into that structure, that steampunk structure, to use the, the phrase that I so care, so care about. So here we are in 2018, and and we've all heard the phrase, if you were born after the age of the Internet, which most of our students are, it's not technology, right? Like if, if if it's been there longer than you've been alive, it's not considered technology. So I want to throw this out there as, as one of our main topics for today. What defines the term innovation? Like what what? What to you, Mike, says innovation? You've seen it all. You've done it all. You've you've been there. You've created it. Is it innovative to you to see some of these wacky things happening at conferences, or are you just like, eh, it's PD, it's always been that way? What is innovation, guys? Well, I see innovation as as either typically one of two things, either a brand new tool, a brand new way of doing something, or a new way of using something that's been around. So what comes to mind for me is for years, Hall Davidson would go around collecting broken uh, video cameras back before we we had video cameras built into our phones. And the reason they were usually broken is the rewind or fast forward mechanism was broken, but the lens itself and the pass through to the cables were still functional. And so he would collect them and say, it's a perfectly functional camera. That's not innovation because it's a brand new camera. That's not innovation because it's got that extra chip that does 4K uh, HD. It's innovation because it's using an, another tool, an older tool, in this case, a broken tool in a way that you wouldn't have thought of. 
like you were talking about with toy hacking, Sam. That's innovation. Even though these are devices that were built you know, years ago or invented years ago, you come up with a different way to use it. So uh, certainly there are exceptions. There are things that go beyond uh, what I feel is valuable professional development that they're trying out in wacky places. But generally, you have to be really outside the lines for me not to see it as a valid professional learning approach uh, because it really is dependent upon the learner, in this case, the educator. Is there a sliding scale on that, Mike? For instance, um, I've been teaching Padlet for the last couple of weeks now to my teachers. I love Padlet, right? Most people think of Padlet as a digital cork board. Well, now they've come out with a way that you can take a Padlet and put it into a stream, which means you now have a chat box inside of your classroom all of a sudden. Is that innovative because you can do something different with it? Or is that just being a good teacher and seeing something and running with it? Well, it always has to go back to the, well, the lesson outcome. If you're trying to teach something and that tool serves it, then great. If you're using it because it's a new feature and you can check a box and now you've got a live stream and you turn to the kids and say, hey, how can we use this? That's different. That's not quite fulfilling a learning objective with you as the teaching professional, the educational professional, trying to address it. Um, we've seen that for years. That's just, hey, instead of using an overhead projector that I borrowed from the, the bowling alley, I'm going to use this $2,000 projector and a laptop, but we're going to do the same thing. That's not innovative at all. That's just you know swapping out one tool for the other and spending a lot more money on it. Right? And we saw plenty of that in the 90s. Uh, you know, In California, we had the Digital High School Initiative, and often that was what happened. They just substituted the, you know, the rolly little grease pen thing with the overhead projector for uh, the LCD projector, and they just built it all into PowerPoint or Hyper Studio or, or something along those lines and failed to really innovate and change what they were trying to teach. Now, you had said that the stuff that Sam is doing with toy hacking is innovative, and, and I agree. He's, he's doing some amazing stuff over there, and you can find out more at mypaperlessclassroom.com. So as we're looking at innovation, as we're looking at doing things a little differently, can we throw out some examples of what innovation is? Things that you might have seen at a convention, conference, ed camp, whatever, that you said, that was pretty awesome. That was somebody thinking outside of the box. Absolutely. I mean, there's, I'll, I'll use the steampunk playground as a, as a recent example. So we came up with the idea of, uh, let's give let, let's give attendees a chance to kick the tires. Let's give them a structure. I invited John Carippo, who I just hired, uh, to come in with his approach on it, and he came up with this IKEA approach where we go and we have various stations that you stop at, but you can't quite skip them. You're sort of forced to go through this path, and uh, we built that out in the Palm Springs Convention Center and set up a space, invited people to come and bring their gear and uh, put experts next to them, but it was really an exploratory uh, approach where you come and you play with things and you try them out, but you've got a nearby expert. We were trying to model what we thought good teaching would be as well. And I think we, we were fairly successful with that. So that playground approach was was then replicated and they invited us to go out to the ISTE conference and uh, and present it there. And we took over and we made a, a playground, a uh, steampunk playground there. And then it replicated and replicated. And we saw that um, being picked up as a model of professional learning that was well received by today's attendees because it really honored the uh, individual explore, exploration and inductive learning, right? The idea that I want to explore and discover what this does my own way. I don't want to sit and watch you lecture at me uh, about it. Um, I don't want you to hold up a, a merge cube, but not let me try it myself. Um, so that, that was sort of the approach that uh, is one example of something that I've seen recently that was, I thought, pretty powerful and, and useful. I'll, I'll try to think of a few others while, while Sam answers. Sam, what do you think? I mean, you've seen professional development all over the place. What have you seen that really made you turn your head and go, you know, that was kind of interesting? Um, I think that really the whole movement towards uh, participant-driven PD uh, first encountered at EdCamp. And that whole, you know, sense of kind of open source PD and every way we have to kind of get that where everybody in the room is really kind of called upon to, you know, share their experience one way or another. Um, the And sometimes it's simple stuff like, you know, this or that. Right. Where you've got this one game, it's got a bunch of different names. Sometimes it's the line game or whatever. And you just have people kind of go to different places based on what they believe. It ends up being, you know, uncomfortable. 
but accessible and ultimately successful. Even at this last conference, we were invited to build a game um, in the middle of this game design presentation. And I, I really didn't want to do it. I just wanted to sit there. I'd been learning all day. It was, you know, it's hard work making things. And I didn't know these people. And it's, it's difficult to kind of jump into a creative task with strangers. But at the same time, if the environment is managed correctly, it can be incredibly rewarding because you end up actually knowing the other people and connecting with them. And, and you know, just to give a, another nod to uh, Mr. Carippo out there in California, sometimes John says one or two things and it, the, the innovation sparks out of you. We had him on a show a couple years ago and somewhere in the conversation, the idea of doing Iron Chef came out. And I am not one to... I. I despise the term think pair share but here we are creating a learning environment where the teachers had to have a problem create a process and like iron chef use the different google apps as a ingredients to then make a lesson on it and when you really break that down that is thinking that's pairing that's sharing but it's it's just coming at it from a completely different yeah. point of view right and they loved yeah. it. And, and, you know, as, as Sam said, it takes a while for the teachers to first go through that phase of, oh, crap, I actually have to do something here. And then you see the acceptance because everyone else is having fun. And then you realize that that one teacher is now running with it. So, yeah. Mike, as we look here, is innovation tied to school culture, right? Like, how, how do we do that? Because you see some school districts that are that are out there, right? You, you look on Twitter and every single week there's something amazing going on. And um, let's just start with that. How, do we, how is innovation and school culture tied together and how do we move it forward? <laughs> He's back. Yay, Sam. So I think it's tied to an openness to try new things. And, and when we were just in the last piece of that conversation, we were talking about how it's hard to, do, to make things. It's hard to go uh, do things. And that really comes, comes down to your comfort zone. And that's when you learn. When you step out of your comfort zone, you learn. I, I'm reminded of uh, Jane McGonigal's keynote at ISTE a few years back, and she's she's all about games and learning. She had everyone in this hall, about 6,000 people gathered, uh, clasp hands with someone next to them, a stranger in most cases, and do the massively multiple, multiplayer thumb war. Uh, and, and so you had on your right hand, you were holding someone's hand, and your left hand, you were holding someone's hand. And you were having to control both thumbs in two different games simultaneously. And then she asked, how many of you won one game? How many of you won both games? How many of you lost both games? And she did that quick thing. And then she taught us a lesson about endorphins that were released when we just spent a minute holding hands with people. Um, and it was this powerful learning experience. Was it a little uncomfortable? Sure. I was holding a man's hand for a full minute that I'd never met before. Um, you know, on my right, on the left, it was a, a lady. And so all of a sudden, again, I hadn't met that person. So it was this really cool thing. And she linked all of the people physically in the audience for a minute and a half. Um, and it was out of our comfort zone. We learned, we sort of chuckled at the end and we released endorphins. So um, that's another innovative approach that really engaged the audience. And I think to answer your question about culture, you just have to have a mindset that's willing to step out of your comfort zone, being willing to learn and, and try new things. When you do that, then all things are possible. Sam, what do you think? Well, I think that innovation is a really interesting buzzword to kind of be trapped in the educational bubble at this point because they're actually antithetical. Education is a system that's set up to replicate the status quo. And for years, the people that run education have been trying to come up with the very best binder that would deliver the very best curriculum to all of the students so they could sell it to all of the schools, which is the opposite of innovation. And when schools say they want innovation, often what they mean is they want things to be better. But those are different things because innovation is, you know, changing things radically in order to make them better. But that process of radical creative change can be woefully uncomfortable. So I think that it's the kind of thing that it has to be really well supported by the administration and really embraced as a school value. I'm really lucky because the school I'm at embraces it as a value and it's a value that's centered on the kids. All of the innovation we're doing is innovation that's powered by their interests and their direction. Um, sometimes it's small things like you know, being willing to pivot a lesson 
because the second grader has a good idea. So suddenly we're all doing his lesson. And sometimes it's much bigger than that, where we say, you know, we need more programs in place that ask students to do things they care about with us. So, I mean, look here, we understand that innovation and culture are tied together. We understand that it's all about making sure that our our leaders are on the right path towards helping with that culture. The question then comes up here is what can we do as tech coaches or teachers to encourage all of this happening? And before we get to that question, I have a question for you, Mr. Lawrence. Is there a fantastic media festival happening sometime soon in the state of California? Yeah, I'm so it's so aligned to your question, and I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, California's Student Media Festival, it's the nation's oldest. It's, it's now in its 52nd year, and it's housed at mediafestival.org, uh, is uh, open now and, and receiving submissions and entries through a new streamlined form with three categories that are brand new. Uh, and uh, it's through April 2nd, you can submit your student's projects. It's open to any K-12 student, public, private, charter, doesn't matter, after school program even. You just have to have someone that's connected to a school uh, sort of vouch for you and submit. And we ask that teachers um, limit their submissions to maybe five per class um, so, that, so that if you do a class-wide project on the dangers and the, and the hazards of smoking, we don't have... 35 submissions on the hazards of smoking. We just have the best one from that class and the best one from the other class. Um, but yeah, free to enter, free to attend. The festival itself is held June 2nd. It's going to be on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood uh, at the um, at the uh, Harmony Gold Preview Playhouse uh, right there on Sunset. So thank you for the opportunity to share it. And for those of you outside of California, we have a page dedicated for you that you can steal this festival, create your own regional festival, take Wait. our room take our streamlined things and, and build your own. Wait a minute. We can create our own innovative professional development. How, how do we do that? Well, I'm glad you mentioned it because the media festival is itself professional development. We have judges that uh, learn by the, by actually going through and evaluating and using the rubric to score these. Uh, but yeah, there's templates there. You get your community involved. You get folks to donate some, some funds so that you can, you can cover your costs uh, I'm not saying it's the easiest, but we have done it. We've done it for 52 years, and we'll continue doing it and making it free based on the generosity of these folks that uh, that have funding and would love to uh, be seen giving a, a, an award to a kid. So think about all those wonderful photo opportunities that uh, for-profit vendors could have standing up on stage saying, and we give you the grand prize award for elementary students in the California Student Media Festival. There's got to be companies around that want that opportunity, that want to celebrate student creativity. You just got to reach out to them and uh, get them involved and uh, get a bunch of teachers and have some popcorn and judge the festival. It's a, it's a blast. It's one of my favorite things to do every year. The website is mediafestival.org. It is the 52nd annual festival, California Student Media Festival. Now, Mike, you also uh, blew by one of the most important parts here. If you sign up, you get a six-month trial of of what again here, Mike? We Video, yes. Our good friends over at We Video have set up a uh, free account for anyone that is entering. You don't have to win even. You just got to say, hey, I'm going to enter my students' projects. And I'd like to try this wee video thing out. There's a link from the homepage, and uh, we encourage folks to go to support all of our sponsors. Uh, they're being, they, they are one of the in-kind sponsors. We've also got other uh, opportunities from other in-kind sponsors to, to use their software. One of them, in fact, is the software we're using right now. Uh, Wirecast is one of our in-kind sponsors. So they're going to give away some prizes to the winners as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. So... Getting back to the idea of being a tech coach, our job is to work primarily with the teachers. And quite often we have these conversations, tech coach to teacher, and it goes something like this. Hey, I'm going to an ed camp. Would you like to go with me? And generally that's the last time the teacher ever speaks to the tech coach. And then the tech coach goes to the administration and says, hey, can we promote this thing? And, the, and then that's usually the last time the administrator, and I'm not, you know, like, uh, Mike, Sam, how can tech coaches have these conversations successfully to encourage teachers to, let's face it, get up on a Saturday morning, leave yeah. their families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, because their, be- their model of PD is... Monday after school, and my God, it's horrible. Well, I, I can reveal to you now the secret of my success. Since I'm not at Q anymore, I can tell you 
the trick. The trick is you're approaching the question the wrong way. You don't ask them to come with you. You, you tell them you need their help. You say, I, I need a favor. Is there any way you can help me out? I'm in over my head. Uh, uh, I, need, I need your brilliance in this area to help me. And when you ask, and we learned this from the Godfather, right? When you ask a favor, you've created a bond. And we as human beings, especially teachers, love to help. We're here in this profession, not for the fabulous riches and the fame and the celebratory uh, nature of our job across the country. We are in it because we are givers. Yeah, exactly. Make it rain, Sam. Make it rain. So that was a trick. I mean, people would say, Mike, what do you do as the CEO of Q? Well, I ask people that have full-time jobs to come and work for me for free. That's what I do. That's what I did. And, and it, is, uh, it is fantastic. And you learn so much when you put them in a, in a role of teaching you uh, and helping you. Yeah, you may have done 50 ed camps before, but you're asking them to come and help you put this thing on for a reason because you see something in them. And it has to be genuine. I'm not saying you're lying to them. Think carefully about what they could bring that's a different perspective, and you want that perspective to help you in this endeavor. So that, that's my secret. That's what I would suggest uh, to, to engage your, te- your fellow teachers and to get them outside that comfort zone and get them to try something new. Because they'll get there, and they'll help you plan it, and then at some point they're going to look around and go, oh, I didn't know that. I'm learning something. Oh, well, you know, I could stand up and pr- do that session. I know how to talk about that topic. And all of a sudden, they're there. So it's a little bit of Tom Story ring, right? How look how fun this is, right? But it is it is that engagement with, and connecting with your fellow educators. Well, and and it's that that placing, acknowledging the value you see in them. Um, there was a conversation Jeff and I have had, I think, a number of times about joining a new staff. And there's a very similar thing you can do there where you ask them for help every opportunity you have. If you need help figuring out the copy machine, sure, you can figure out the copy machine, but you can ask for help. And then they've helped you out. And then you're building that relationship with them. So, yeah, I think that, you know, on one hand, always being helpful. And on the other hand, always asking for help is a great way to kind of build those relationships and overcome those barriers of, right. I don't want to do this on the weekend. I don't need to go sit in a room, listen to some other guy talk. And it works. I, yep. I, I will tell you, you know, and yeah, Sam and I have been like, you know, joking about it through text messages, but it, it works. Right. Yeah. And, well, his and point, his point is valid though. You have to also be willing to help. You have to always yep. offer to help. And I, I neglected to mention that. And it is crucial because otherwise you'll just be perceived as the guy that always needs help instead of the one that's willing to pitch in. Right. So when it comes to our administration, you know, most tech coaches are those go-getters, are those ed camp creators, are those ISTE folk, right? How do you go to your administration and say, look, um, what you're doing isn't working. Let's try it some other way. What does that conversation look like? You don't have that conversation with them. That's somebody else's job. Okay. So so, so I say, hey, we need need to host an ed camp. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you can put all of the examples in front of them. They show up because it's at their house. And, you know, you say, wouldn't it be great to look, you know, innovative and kind of on the front edge of all of this, you know, pedagogy? You want some of your teachers to actually participate? Let's host an ed camp. Let's have some kids volunteer. We can get teachers there. And then you've got this conversation going and you've never expressed a value opinion about the job they're doing. Because I can promise you, your administrator is getting value statements about the job they're doing from other sources. I, uh, I can neither confirm nor deny Sam's approach, but I will say uh, the, the most success I've seen is when you, you look deeply at what they're being evaluated based on. You look deeply about what they care about, and then you present at, at timely moments opportunities for them to decide to do the thing that you want them to do. And then it's their idea, right? We all know that leaders love to be perceived as having that innovative idea. So if you can subtly present to them examples in, in key moments and send them uh, opportunities, uh, you know, it would lead them there. It can be a longer game. You've got to play. But, you know, I'm reminded of uh, an administrator who 
just was not a big computer user. And this is when we were setting up computers and giving them their first email access. And so I found out that they were an avid bird watcher. It had nothing to do with their job, what they, what they did at the school, but they were an avid bird watcher. And so this was in the early days of the internet. I found on the web, and I know nothing about bird watching, but I found on the web all these bird watching websites. And he said, oh yeah, I, I subscribed to that magazine. Oh yeah, I, I know that. That's a TV show about bird watching. Like, and you found things on the internet that would engage them and they started using the computer. They started learning more. And then I showed them how to play, you know, Minesweeper. So they got good at mousing. You just got to connect to what they're interested in or what they're evaluated on. It's either how do you increase their pleasure or decrease their pain, right? That how you behavior modified the, the core principle. And so if you could find either of those motivators to get them to decide to do the right thing, the innovative thing, um, then, then you're in the right, uh, in the right space. Well, let's let's turn the, 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 the corner here and, and kind of put a bow on this episode. When it comes to innovative PD, um, I find a lot of technology coaches are bored, right? Like you're in a school district where everything is running at a slower pace than you run because you go to conferences and when you go to regular PD, it's it's not at the space or you're going to PD and you're the one giving it constantly, right? Mike, Sam, when you're looking for inspiration for yourself, where do you turn to? Like, where are the places that, as a tech coach listening to this podcast out there, where do you guys go to find that new and innovative thing? Ah, I have the perfect answer for this. Up to you. The 1970s. What? 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 Uh the, the 1970s, Jeff, um, there were a lot of really good ideas in the 1970s. And if you just go and look at some of them and try them and adapt them for now, they seem brand new. Um, some of my favorite ones come from Fred Rogers television show. It spans even more time. Um, that's often where I'll go for inspiration. But um, yeah, especially writing theory, like instructional theory about the teaching of writing, especially creative writing for the 1970s. That's, that's really where I go for inspiration. It might not be that way for everybody, but I find if I step out of the mainstream of ideas that everyone is trying really hard to push and step into a different time frame and really look at what was valued then, I can get kind of a, a broader perspective. Does that mean we're going to be seeing Waka wearing bell bottoms? He already wears bell bottoms. We just never shoot that low. <laughs> that's the best answer ever. And his name is Waka. I mean, come on, that's the sound right? of the 70s. Waka, 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 Waka. Wow. Right? Wow. Yeah. That's the sound of corduroy running. That is precisely. <laughs> or one hand clapping. But Mike, what, 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 what? What what I have a question, Mike. I have a question. It's a little off topic. Uh oh, but it's it's actually circling back. Can you submit three D printed projects to the Student Media Festival? Yes, you can. It's a new category, and then we print them out, and the judges judge them, and then we have them at the actual festival. I'm so glad you brought that up. What what kind of criteria are the, is that judged on? Uh, we just essentially have the same rubric out there. It has to be something that explains a, an instructional concept. That's why the whole festival is built around um, uh, looking for ways to use media, in this case, physical 3D printed media, uh, to teach a concept. And so uh, we're, we're kind of a asking that question as well, like, well, what are we going to get? And we'll see what we get this year. So we're, we're very excited about that new category. So my, my sixth graders who made percentage dolls and scanned their heads and we 3D printed the heads and then they built the rest of the doll. That's something we could submit. If we're, yeah. Was this a math concept about percentage that you yes. were? Yes. Then please. Yes. I would love it. Oh, my goodness. That is so exciting. No, I know Jeffrey's squirming because he wants us to wrap this no, up. No, no, no. I, I just figured you're stalling for time here after you said that <laughs> Sam had the best answer. Well, his answer was great. I go somewhere more mundane. It's outside of education. I go to television commercials. If you look oh. at the artistry that has to be put in, it's like it's like our modern haiku because you have 15 or 30 or 60 seconds to convey an idea and not just an idea, but you want somebody to take their wallet out and spend money uh, on this. And so people uh, that are better paid than I am have spent hours and days trying to figure out the best possible way to craft those messages. And it gives me ideas, uh, lesson plan ideas, creativity, different ways 
to uh, to promote something? Because at the end of the day, I don't know if you agree with this, but tech coaches, especially if you're district wide, you it's a sales job. You need to convince teachers who are to work harder, way too busy to call you up and help them either in their classroom right. or after school. So you need to be an expert salesperson to get them to understand the value your services provide and then actually not pick out the wallet, but pick up the phone or the email or text you or something to, to spend time changing their teaching practice. And that's it's the thing. only thing we have less of than money. <laughs> time. Exactly. So I would, I would encourage us to look at the lessons provided to us on a daily basis, on an hourly basis by the advertising world, because they, uh, not all commercials, but they have, the best ones, have a, a story. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. There is a hook. There is a call to action. And if we, if we study these carefully, uh, they have given us fantastic ideas. You referenced the Iron Chef idea. That's also on television. I'm doing a keynote with Ann Cosma in a couple of weeks in Monterrey, Mexico. We're adapting the game show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to be Who Wants to Be an Edu Innovator. And we're going to transform a keynote model based on an idea from a TV show we watched. And it all became, it all happened because we realized this keynote is in the round. And I thought, well, what else is in the round? What, what should we be doing this based on? And I wanted to be, to be engaging and involve the audience. And we're going to have phone a keynote and all sorts of stickers we pass out to people. So that's where I get ideas is, is generally in that commercial space or television space. Um, uh, and I would encourage folks to look to that as well. I, I completely agree with that. And this goes back to other conversations that Sam and I have of, you know, it's one thing to get up and do a PD session as a tech coach to say, today you will be learning about. And what I've done over the last six months or so is, you know, again, with Sam's help, I've started with, here's my story. Here's how I relate to you. Here's how all this works together. Because, again, you're looking at Iron Chef. You're looking at who wants to be a millionaire. You know, when you watch those shows, you're putting yourself in the hot seat. Right. And now that's how you focus. Well, if I can get a teacher to go, oh, that guy used to be with me. So, for instance, today I had a teacher find me and she says, look, I teach quarter courses. Every nine weeks I do the same thing. Help me do this. And I, my first thing I said to her was, look, for four years I taught three quarter courses where I was doing the same thing over and over again. And you could just see this, you know, this defensive, I'm, yeah. I'm stressed at this. And, you know, I, I don't know why I'm talking to you, but I have to. And it just turned out to be, ah, let's have a conversation. Yeah. And, and, and I love that. And I love that. You know, that's why we do the podcast here. That's why we have innovative guests and stuff on there. If you are a tech coach, we want to hear from you. Um, we'd love to have you as a guest on this show. We'd love to hear what works from you. And we certainly want to hear out there what topics you'd like to hear on the show. Uh, Sam, Mike, thank you guys so much. Uh, Sam, give us your final thoughts on innovative professional development and where can we learn more about the great things happening in your part of the country innovative professional development at this point if you're look if you've got pd and you're looking to be more innovative ask yourself how can i pivot towards my participants interests and needs you can find me and everything i do at mypaperlessclassroom.com the great blog with a little pug <laughs> and great bumpers too i should say sam <laughs> Mike, where can we, uh, first of all, Mike, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. It's, it's been a pleasure and an honor to have you on. You guys are doing some great stuff out there. Um, of course, you know, Q has taken off under your leadership. And now as Power School, we're looking forward to seeing where you, where you take Power School and what we can expect. Um, tell us a little bit about where we can find you, Mike. Sure. I got a website up at MikeLawrence.me because that's me, Mike Lawrence. And uh, I started up a consulting firm at Maverick Learning, which is at mavlearn.com. Uh, and uh, I'm kind of setting that aside now with my new gig at Power School. But uh, it has, I think, some, some interesting pages to look at. Um, and uh, occasionally you might find me up on stage with uh, Glenn Warren singing. He's, he's on keyboards and I sing. We call ourselves the, uh, the Groove Brothers. Where I know we're performing at SETPA in November in Sacramento. So... Mark your calendars and uh, head on up to the SETPA conference, and you might see me and Glenn rocking it out in our little lounge act. And Red Pen, the band that, that, that birthed the Groove Brothers, Red Pen hasn't performed for a couple of years, but uh, it's the all-teacher band, and we have far too much fun and don't take ourselves seriously. But I have um, 
but th- that's where you can find me. And, and of course, Tech Maverick uh, on the Twitters. Certainly check that out, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show. And if you guys are out there looking to be a part of the show, we would certainly welcome it. We have several great podcasts. You can join our Teacher Cast show. Our Tech Educator show is now back live every single Wednesday night, a new night in time. Wednesday nights at 830. You can check that out. And of course, I hope you have a moment to take out to check out the brand new teachercast.net we just relaunched it a few weeks ago it is doing fantastic and uh, check out all the great stuff that's happening there three amazing content strands you can learn all about in- instructional technology stem education and of course instructional technology coaching and leadership in there on behalf of everybody here in the teacher cast educational network my name is jeff bradbury saying keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students